Act One of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. Act One, Scene One, Elsinore, a platform before the castle. Francisco at his post. Enter to him Bernardo. Who's there? <laughs> Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo. He. You come most carefully upon your hour. This now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand, ho, who's there? Enter Horatio and Marcellus. Friends to this ground. And liegemen to the Dane. Give you good night. O oh, farewell, honest soldier, who hath relieved you. Bernardo has my place. Oh, give you good night. Exit. Holla, Bernardo. Say, what, is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good to Marcellus. What, has this thing appeared again to-night? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we have two nights seen. Well, sit we down, and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westwards from the pole had made his course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one, enter ghost. Peace, break thee off. Look, where it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Looks it not like the king. Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurpest this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay. Speak, speak, I charge thee, speak. Exit ghost. Tis gone, and will not answer. How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? Before my God, I might not this believe without the sensible and true avouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he the ambitious Norway combated. So frowned he once when, in an angry parl, he smote the sledded pole-axe on the ice. Tis strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not. But, in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now, sit down and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land, and why such daily cast of brazen cannon, and foreign mart for implements of war, why such impress of shipwrights, whose sore task does not divide a Sunday from the week, what might be toward, that this sweety haste doth make the night joint labourer with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I, at least the whisper goes. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, thereto pricked on by a most emulate pride, dared to the combat, in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit, with his life, 
all those his lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king which had returned to the inheritance of fortinbras had he been vanquisher as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed his fell to hamlet now sir young fortinbras of unimproved metal hot and full hath in the skirts of norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it which is no other as it doth well appear unto our state but to recover of us by strong hands and terms compulsory those foresaid lands so by his father lost and this i take it is the main motive of our preparations the source of this our watch and the chief head of this post haste and roamage in the land i think it be no other but e'en so well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch so like the king that was and is the question of these wars a mote it is to trouble the mind's eye in the most high and palmy state of rome a little ere the mightiest julius fell the grave stood tenantless and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the roman streets as stars with trains of fire and dews of blood disasters in the sun and the moist star upon whose influence neptune's empire stands was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse and even the like precurse of fierce events as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue of the omen coming on have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climaters and countrymen but soft behold lo where it comes again re-enter ghost i'll cross it though it blast me stay illusion if thou hast any sound or use of voice speak to me if there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me speak to me cock crows if thou art privy to thy country's fate which happily for knowing may avoid o oh, speak or if thou hast abhorred in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth for which they say you spirits oft walk in death speak of it stay and speak stop it marcellus shall i strike at it with my partisan do if it will not stand tis here tis here tis gone exit ghost we do it wrong being so majestical to offer it the show of violence for it is as the air invulnerable and our vein blows malicious mockery it was about to speak when the cock crew and then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons i have heard the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day and at his warning whether in sea or fire in earth or air the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine and of the truth herein this present object made probation it faded on the crowing of the cock some say that ever against the season comes wherein our saviour's birth is celebrated the bird of dawning singeth all night long and then they say no spirit dares stare abroad the nights are wholesome then no planet strike no fairy takes nor which hath powers to charm so hallowed and so gracious is the time so have i heard and do in part believe it but look the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill break we our watch up and by my advice let us impart what we have seen to-night unto young hamlet for upon my life this spirit dumb to us will speak to him do you consent we shall acquaint him with it as needful in our loves fitting our duty let's do it i pray and i this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently exeunt scene two a room of state in the castle enter king claudius queen gertrude hamlet polonius laertes voltimand cornelius lords and attendants though yet of hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him 
together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, an equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all, our thanks. Now follows that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleagued with the dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father, with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Now for ourself and for this time of meeting. Thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltimand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste commend your duty. In, In that, that and, and all things, things we will show, we will our, show duty. our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. Exeunt Voltimand and Cornelius. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is't, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane, and loose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? My dread lord, your leave and favour to return to France. From whence so willingly I came to Denmark, to show my duty in your coronation, Yet now I must confess, that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last upon his will I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet, and my son. Aside. A little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord, I am too much o' the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not for ever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Ay, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam, nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. "'Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. "'Tis unmanly grief.' 
It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Fie! Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first course till he that died to-day, this must be so. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks to-day, but the great cannon to the cloud shall tell, and the kings rouse the heavens all breet again, respeaking earthly thunder. Come, away. Exeunt all but Hamlet. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon gainst self-slaughter. Oh, God! God! How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world! Fie, aunt! Ah, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king, that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember? Why, she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month. Let me not think on't. Frailty thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married, with my uncle my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. O oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets! It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Enter Horatio. Marcellus and Bernardo. Hail to your lordship. I'm glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus? My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Good even, sir. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do mine ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee, do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? 
in my mind's eye horatio i saw him once he was a goodly king he was a man take him for all in all i shall not look upon his like again my lord i think i saw him yesternight saw who my lord the king your father the king my father season your admiration for a while with an attent ear till i may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you for god's love let me hear two nights together had these gentlemen marcellus and bernardo on their watch in the dead vast and middle of the night been thus encountered a figure like your father armed at point exactly cap a pay appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear surprised eyes within his truncheon's length whilst they distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear stand dumb and speak not to him this to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did and i with them the third night kept the watch where as they had delivered both in time form of the thing each word made true and good the apparition comes i knew your father these hands are not more like but where was this my lord upon the platform where we watched did you not speak to it my lord i did but answer made it none yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion like as it would speak but even then the morning cock crew loud and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight tis very strange as i do live my honoured lord tis true and we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it indeed indeed sirs but this troubles me hold you the watch to-night we do, we my, do lord. my lord armed say you armed, armed my, my lord. lord from top to toe my, my lord, lord from, from head, head to, foot. to foot then saw you not his face oh yes my lord he wore his beaver up what looked he frowningly a countenance more in sorrow than in anger pale or red nay very pale and fixed his eyes upon you most constantly i would i had been there it would have much amazed you very like very like stayed it long while one with moderate haste might tell a hundred longer 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 not when i saw it his beard was grizzled no it was as i have seen it in life a sable silvered i will watch to-night perchance twill walk again i warrant it will if it assume my noble father's person i'll speak to it though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap to-night, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our, Our duty, duty to your, to your honour. Your loves, as mine to you. Farewell. Exeunt all but Hamlet. My father's spirit, in arms! All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come! Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Exit. Scene three. A room in Polonius's house. Enter Laertes and Ophelia. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep but let me hear from you do you doubt that for hamlet and the trifling of his favour hold it a fashion and a toy in blood a violet in the youth of primy nature forward not permanent sweet not lasting the perfume and suppliance of a minute no more no more but so think it no more for nature crescent does not grow alone in thews and bulk but as this temple waxes the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide withal Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cottle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear, his greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and the health of his whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed which is no further than the main voice of denmark goes withal 
then weigh what loss your honour may sustain if with too credent ear you list his songs or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity fear it ophelia fear it my dear sister and keep you in the rear of your affection out of the shot and danger of desire the chariest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes the canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed and in the morn and liquid dew of youth contagious blastments are most imminent be wary then best safety lies in fear youth to itself rebels though none else near i shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart but good my brother do not as some ungracious pastors do show me the steep and thorny way to heaven whiles like a puffed and reckless libertine himself the primrose path of dalliance treads and wrecks not his own reed oh fear me not i stay too long but here my father comes enter polonius a double blessing is a double grace occasion smiles upon a second leave yet here laertes aboard aboard for shame the wind sits in the shoulder of your sail and you are stayed for there my blessing with thee and these few precepts in thy memory see thou character give thy thoughts no tongue nor any unproportioned thought his act be thou familiar but by no means vulgar those friends thou hast and their adoption tried grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched unfledged comrade beware of entrance to a quarrel but being in bet thou the opposed may beware of thee give every man thy ear but few thy voice take each man's censure but reserve thy judgment costly thy habit as thy purse can buy but not expressed in fancy rich not gaudy for the apparel oft proclaims the man and they in france of the best rank and station are of a most select and generous chief in that neither a borrower nor a lender be for loan oft loses both itself and friend and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry this above all to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man farewell my blessing season this in thee most humbly do i take my leave my lord the time invites you go your servants tend farewell ophelia and remember well what i have said to you tis in my memory locked and you yourself shall keep the key of it farewell exit what is't ophelia he hath said to you so please you something touching the lord hamlet marry well be thought tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous if it be so as so it is put on me and that in way of caution i must tell you you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour what is between you give me up the truth he hath my lord of late made many tenders of his affection to me affection pooh you speak like a green girl unsifted in such perilous circumstance do you believe his tenders as you call them i do not know my lord what i should think marry i'll teach you think yourself a baby that you obtain these tenders for true pay which are not sterling tend yourself more dearly or not to crack the wind of the poor phrase running it thus you'll tender me a fool my lord he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion ay fashion you may call it go to go to and hath given countenance to his speech my lord 
with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Ay, springs to catch woodcocks, I do know, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows, these blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promise, as it is a-making, you must not take for fire. From this time, be somewhat scatter of your maiden presence, set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him, that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk, than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers, not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious boards, the better to beguile. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Exeunt. Scene four. The Platform. Enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed, I heard it not. Then it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. A flourish of trumpets and ordnance shot off within. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake to-night and takes his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering upspring reels. And as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle-drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Ay, Mary, is't. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed revel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They keep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men, that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the o'ergrowth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason, or by some habit that too much o'er leavens the form of plausive manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of eel doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Enter ghost. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly inurned hath oped his ponderous and marbled jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean, that thou, dead coarse, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? Ghost beckons Hamlet. It beckons you to go away with it, as if it some impartment did desire to you alone. Look, with that courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground, but do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life in a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? 
It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation, without more motive, into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on. I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled. You shall not go. My fate cries out, and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say away. Go on. I'll follow thee. Exeunt Ghost and Hamlet. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. Exeunt. Scene five. Another part of the platform. Enter Ghost and Hamlet. Where wilt thou lead me? Speak, I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come. When I to sulphurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost! Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, thy knotted and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, O oh, list, if thou didst ever thy dear father love. O oh, God! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul, as in the best it is. But this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt. And duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on lethe wharf wouldst thou not stir in this. Now, Hamlet, hear, tis given out, that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me, so the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. O oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle! Ay, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, O oh, wicked wit and gifts, that have the power so to seduce, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. O oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there from me, whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, Though lewdness court it in a shape of heaven, So lust, though to a radiant angel linked, Will sate itself in a celestial bed, 
and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I scent the morning air, brief let me be, sleeping within my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon, upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole, with juice of cursed hebanon in a vial, and in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distilment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man, that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigour doth posset and curd, like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine, and a most instant tetter barked about, most laser-like, with vile and loathsome crust, all my smooth body. Thus was I, sleeping, by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh, horrible! Oh, horrible! Most horrible! If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge, to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once. The glow-worm shows the matin to be near, and gins to pale his uneffectual fire. Adieu. Adieu, Hamlet, remember me. Exit. O oh, all you host of heaven, O oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? O oh, fie, hold, hold my heart, and you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven! O oh, most pernicious woman! O oh, villain! Villain! Smiling! Damned villain! My tables! Meet it is I set it down that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. Writing. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word. It is a Jew. A Jew. Remember me. I have sworn it. My lord! My, my lord! lord. My lord, Lord Hamlet. Heaven, secure him. So be it. Hello, ho, ho, my lord. Hello, ho, ho, boy. Come, bird, come. Enter Horatio and Marcellus. How is't, my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord, tell it. No, you'll reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Nor I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret. Ay, by I heaven, my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an errant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right. You heard the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for mine own poor part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is, Horatio, and much offence, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you, for your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, 
As you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is it, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, my lord we, will we will not. not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Aha, boy, sayest thou so? Art thou there, true penny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage. Consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. Hic et ubique, then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear. Well said, old mole. Canst work i' the earth so fast, a worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here as before, never, so help you mercy, how strange or odd soe'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think me to put an antic disposition on, that you, at such time seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head-shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as, well, well, we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if there might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you. Swear! Swear! Rest, rest, perturbed spirit. They swear. So, gentlemen, with all my love I do commend me to you, and what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together, and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, A Room in Polonius's House. Enter Polonius and Reynaldo. Give him this money and these notes, Rinaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvellous wisely, good Rinaldo, before you visit him to make inquire of his behaviour. My lord, I did intend it. Marry, well said, very well said. Look you, sir. Inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, and how, and who, what means, and where they keep, what company, at what expense, and finding, by this encompassment and drift of question, that they do know, my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it. Take you, as twere, some distant knowledge of him, as thus, I know his father and his friends, and in part him. Do you mark this, Reynaldo? Aye. Very well, my lord. And in part him. But you must say, not well, but, if it be he I mean, he's very wild, addicted uh, so-and-so. And there put on him what forgeries you please. Marry, none so rank as may dishonour him, take heed of that. But, uh, sir, such wanton, wild, unusual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord. Ay, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, drabbing, you may go so far. My lord, that would dishonour him. 
faith no as you may season it in the charge you must not put another scandal on him that he is open to incontinency that's not my meaning but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty the flash and outbreak of a fiery mind a savageness in the unreclaimed blood of general assault but my good lord wherefore should you do this i my lord i would know that marry sir here's my drift and i believe it is a fetch of wit you laying these slight sallies on my son as twere a thing little soiled in the working mark you your party in converse him you would sound having ever seen in the predominant crimes the youth you breathe of guilty be assured he closes with you in this consequence good sir or so or friend or gentleman according to the phrase or the addition of man and country very good my lord and then sir does he this he does uh, what was i about to say by the mass i was about to say something where did i leave at closes in the consequence a friend or so and gentleman at closes in the consequence ay marry he closes thus i know the gentleman i saw him yesterday or t'other day or then or then with such or such and as you say there was a gaming there overtook in rouse there folly out at tennis or perchance i saw him enter such a house of sale videlicet a brothel or so forth see you now your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth and thus do we of wisdom and of reach with windlasses and assays of bias by indirections find directions out so by my former lecture and advice shall you my son you have me have you not my lord i have god be with you fare you well good my lord observe his inclination in yourself i shall my lord and let him ply his music well my lord farewell exit reynaldo enter ophelia how oh, now ophelia what's the matter oh my lord my lord i have been so affrighted with what in the name of god my lord as i was sewing in my closet lord hamlet with his doublet all unbraced no hat upon his head his stockings fouled ungartered and down gyved to his ankle pale as his shirt his knees knocking each other and with a look so piteous in purport as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors he comes before me mad for thy love my lord i do not know but truly i do fear it what said he he took me by the wrist and held me hard then goes he to the length of all his arm and with his other hand thus o'er his brow he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it long stayed he so at last a little shaking of mine arm and thrice his head thus waving up and down he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and in his being that done he lets me go and with his head over his shoulder turned he seemed to find his way without his eyes for out of doors he went without their helps and to the last bended their light on me come go with me i will go seek the king this is the very ecstasy of love whose violent property fordoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures i am sorry what have you given him any hard words of late no my good lord but as you did command i did repel his fetters and denied his access to me that hath made him mad i am sorry that with better heed and judgment i had not quoted him 
i feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee but uh, beshrew my jealousy by heaven it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion come go we to the king this must be known which being kept close might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love exeunt scene two a room in the castle enter king claudius queen gertrude rosencrantz guildenstern and attendants welcome dear rosencrantz and guildenstern moreover that we much did long to see you the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending something have you heard of hamlet's transformation so call it sith nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was what it should be more than his father's death that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself i cannot dream of i entreat you both that being of so young days brought up with him and sith so neighboured to his youth and haviour that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus that opened lies within our remedy good gentlemen he hath much talked of you and sure i am two men there are not living to whom he more adheres if it will please you to show us so much gentry and good will as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance both your majesties might by the sovereign power you have of us put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty but we both obey and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded thanks rosencrantz and gentle guildenstern thanks guildenstern and gentle rosencrantz and i beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son go some of you and bring these gentlemen where hamlet is heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him ay amen exeunt rosencrantz guildenstern and some attendants enter polonius the ambassadors from norway my good lord are joyfully returned thou still hast been the father of good news have i my lord i assure my good liege i hold my duty as i hold my soul both to my god and to my gracious king and i do think or else this breed of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do that i have found the very cause of hamlet's lunacy oh speak of that that do i long to hear give first admittance to the ambassadors my news shall be the fruit to that great feast thyself do grace to them and bring them in exit polonius he tells me my dear gertrude he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper i doubt it is no other but the main his father's death and ah or hasty marriage well we shall sift him re-enter polonius with voltimand and cornelius welcome my good friends say voltimand what from our brother norway most fair return of greetings and desires upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies which to him appeared to be a preparation gainst the polack but better looked into he truly found it was against your highness whereas grieved that so his sickness age and impotence was falsely borne in hand sends out arrests on Fortinbras, which he in brief obeys receives rebuke from norway and in fine makes vow before his uncle never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty whereon old norway overcome with joy gives him three thousand crowns in annual fee and his commission to employ those soldiers so levied as before against the polack 
with an entreaty herein further shown giving a paper that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise on such regard of safety and allowance as therein are set down it likes us well and at our more considered time will read answer and think upon this business meantime we thank you for your well took labour go to your rest at night we'll feast together most welcome home exeunt voltimand and cornelius this business is well ended my liege and madam to expostulate what majesty should be what duty is why day is day night night and time is time were nothing but to waste a night day and time therefore since brevity is the soul of wit and hideousness the limbs and outward flourishes i will be brief your noble son is mad mad call i it for to define true madness what is but to be nothing else but mad but let that go more matter with less art madam i swear i use no art at all that he is mad tis true tis true tis pity and pity tis tis true a foolish figure but farewell it for i will use no art mad let us grant him then and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect or rather say the cause of this defect for this effect defective comes by cause thus it remains and the remainder thus perpend i have a daughter have while she is mine who in her duty and obedience mark hath given me this now gather and surmise reads to the celestial and my soul's idol the most beautified ophelia that's an ill phrase a vile phrase beautified is a vile phrase but you shall hear thus reads in her excellent wide bosom these uh, etc came this from hamlet to her good madam stay a while i will be faithful reads doubt thou the stars are fire doubt that the sun doth move doubt truth to be a liar but never doubt i love oh dear ophelia i am ill at these numbers i have not art to reckon my groans but that i love thee best o oh, most best believe it adieu thine evermore most dear lady whilst this machine is to him hamlet this in obedience hath my daughter shown me and more above hath his solicitings as they fell out by time by means and place all given to mine ear but how hath she received his love what do you think of me as of a man faithful and honourable i would fain prove so but what might you think when i had seen this hot love on the wing as i perceived it i must tell you that before my daughter told me what might you o oh my dear majesty your queen here think if i had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking a mute and dumb or looked upon this love with idle sight what might you think no i went round to work and my young mistress thus i did bespeak lord hamlet is a prince out of thy star this must not be and then i precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort admit no messengers receive no tokens which done she took the fruits of my advice and he repulsed a short tale to make fell into a sadness then into a fast thence to a watch thence into a weakness thence to a lightness and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves 
and all we mourn for. Do you think tis this? It may be, very likely. Had there been uh, such a time, I'd fain know that, that I have positively said, tis so, when it proved otherwise? Not that I know. Pointing to his head and shoulder. Take this, from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the centre. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arras then. Mark the encounter. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for estate, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look, where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you both away. I'll board him presently. Exeunt King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, and attendants. Enter Hamlet, reading. Oh, give me leave. How does my good lord Hamlet? Well, God a mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Uh, not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord. I, sir, to be honest, as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun breed maggots and a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. Aside. How see you by that? Still harpy on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly, in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love. Very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I mean, uh, the matter that you read, my lord. Slanders, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum-tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak hands. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down, for yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward. Aside. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that is out of the air. Aside. How pregnant sometimes his replies are, a happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him, and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, except my life. Accept my life. Accept my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You go to seek the Lord Hamlet? There he is. God save you, sir. Exit Polonius. My honoured lord. My most dear lord. My excellent good friends. How dost thou, Guildenstern? Ah, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do ye both? as the indifferent children of the earth happy and that we are not over happy on fortune's cap we are not the very button nor the soles of her shoes neither my lord then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favours faith her privates we in the secret parts of fortune oh most true she is a strumpet what's the news none my lord but that the world's grown honest 
then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord. Denmark's a prison. <laughs> then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God! I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams, indeed, are ambition. For the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies, and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggar's shadows. Shall we to the court, for by my fay I cannot reason? We'll, we'll wait, wait upon, upon you, my lord. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. For to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come. Nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. You were sent for, and there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. <laughs> to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposer could charge you withal, be even and direct with me whether you were sent for or no. Aside to Guildenstern. What say you? Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery, and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving how express and admirable! In action how like an angel! In apprehension how like a god! The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals! And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh, then, when I said man delights not me? To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what lent and entertainment the players shall receive from you. We cotted them on the way, and hither they are coming to offer you service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickled of the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. What players are they? Even those you are wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chance is it they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. 
Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? Nay, their endeavour keeps in the wanted place. But there is, sir, an airy of children, little Iases, that cry out on the top of question, and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, and so berattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose-quills, and dare scarce come thither. What? Are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escotted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards, if they should grow themselves to common players, as it is most like, if their means are no better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Faith, there has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them to controversy. <laughs> there was, for a while, no money bid for argument unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. Is it possible? Oh, there has been much throwing about of brains. Do the boys carry it away? Ay, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. It is not very strange. For mine uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mows at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. Splud, there is something in this more than natural if philosophy could find it out. Flourish of trumpets within. There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands come, then. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which, I tell you, must show fairly outward, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a hand-saw. Enter Polonius. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too, at each ear a hearer. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. Happily he's the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players, mark it. Uh, you say right, sir, a uh, Monday morning, twas so indeed. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome— The actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon mine honour. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical historical pastoral, scene individable, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the law of writ and liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou! What a treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter and no more, the which he loved passing well. Still on my daughter. Am I not i' the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God wot, and then, you know, it came to pass, as most like it was, the first row of the pious chanson will show you more, for look where my abridgment comes. Enter four or five players. You are welcome, masters, welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend, thy face is valenced since I saw thee last. Comest thou to beard me in Denmark? What, my young lady and mistress? By your lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a chopping. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. We'll e'en to it like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted. Or if it was not above once, for the play, I remember, pleased not the million. Twas caviar to the general, but it was. 
as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved, t'was Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout of it especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see, let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast. It is not so, it begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble, when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now is he total ghouls, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets, that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their lord's murder, roasted in wrath and fire. And thus o'ersized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam, seeks. So, proceed you. For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Anon he finds him, striking too short at Greeks, his antique sword rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear, for lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm a silence in the heavens, the rack stand still, the bold winds speechless, and the orb below as hush as death, anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus' pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armor, forged for proof return, with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune! All you gods in general synod! Take away her power, break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven as low as to the fiends. This is too long. It shall to the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on, he's for a jig or a tail of baudry, or he sleeps. Say on, come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the mobled queen? The Mobled Queen. That's good. Mobled Queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison room, a clout upon that head where late the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all o'er timid loins a blanket, in the alarm of fear caught up. Who this had seen, with tongue in venom steeped, Gainst fortune's state would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, When she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport In mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, The instant burst of clamour that she made, Unless things mortal move them not at all, Would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven And passion in the gods. Look whether he has not turned his colour, and has tears in his eyes. Pray you no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak out the rest soon. 
Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear, let them be well used, for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's bodykins, man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who should scape whipping? Use them after your own honour and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play to-morrow. Exit Polonius with all the players but the first. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, my lord. We'll hat to-morrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which I would set down and insert in, could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you, mock him not. Exit first player. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Aye, so God be with ye. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I! Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing! For Hecuba! What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do, had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears, and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty, and appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy-mettled rascal, peak like John a dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing, no, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! Swoons, I should take it. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful. Bloody, bawdy villain! Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless, villain! Oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing, like a very drab, a scullion. Fie upon it! Fuh! about my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks, I'll tent him to the quick, if he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps, out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, A Room in the Castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. And can you, by no drift of circumstance, get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps aloof. When we would bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did he receive you well? boast like a gentleman but with much forcing of his disposition did you assay him to any pastime madam it so fell out that certain players we all wrought on the way of this we told him and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear it they are about the court and as i think they have already ordered this night to play before him tis most true and he beseech me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter with all my heart, and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge, and drive his purpose on to these delights. We shall, my lord. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Sweet Gertrude, leave us too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he, as twere by accident, may hear affront Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves that, seeing unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge, and gather by him, as he is behaved, if t be the affliction of his love or no, that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again to both your honours madame i wish it may exit queen gertrude ophelia walk you here gracious so please you we will bestow ourselves to ophelia read on this book that show of such an exercise may colour your loneliness we are oft to blame in this tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Aside. Oh, tis too true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience! The harlot's cheek, beautied with plastering art, is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word. Oh, heavy burden! I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. Exeunt King Claudius and Polonius. Enter Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die to sleep to sleep perchance to dream ay there's the rub for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death the undiscovered country, from whose bore no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, 
and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia, nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good my lord, how does your honour for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, longed to re-deliver. I pray you, now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honoured lord, you know right well you did, and with them words of so sweet breath composed, as made the things more rich, their perfume lost. Take these again, for to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Ay, truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bawd than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was some time a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me, for virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offences at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens! If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery, go, farewell. Or, if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool, for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go, and quickly too, farewell. O oh, heavenly powers, restore him! I have heard of your paintings too well enough. God has given you one face, and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp, and nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll no more on't. It hath made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go. Exit. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown! The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down, and I of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled, out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me! To have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Re-enter King Claudius and Polonius. Love! His affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul o'er which his melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger, which, for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England, for the demand of our neglected tribute. Haply the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart 
whereon his brains still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you want? It shall do well, yet do I believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. My lord, do as you please, but if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him, and I'll be placed, so please you, in the air of all their conference. If she find him not, to England send him, or confine him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. Exeunt. Scene two. A hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and players. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb-shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. I warrant your honour. Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone or come tardy off, though it make the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must in your allowance o'erweigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh, to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, though in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. Exeunt players. Enter Polonius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. How now, my lord? Will the king hear this piece of work? And the queen, too and that presently. Bid the players make haste. Exit Polonius. Will you two help to hasten them? We will, my lord. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What ho, Horatio? Enter Horatio. Here, sweet lord, at your service. Horatio, thou art e'en as just a man as e'er my conversation coped withal. Oh, my dear lord. Nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee, that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? No, let the candied tongue lick absurd pomp, and crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning. Dost thou hear? Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice, and could of men distinguish, her election hath sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing, a man that fortune's buffets and rewards hast ta'en with equal thanks, and blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commingled, that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Give me that man that is not passion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core, ay, 
in my heart of heart, as I do thee. Something too much of this. There is a play to-night before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. I prithee, when thou seest that act afoot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe mine uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen, and my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan's stithy. Give him a heedful note, for I mine eyes will rivet to his face, and after we will both our judgments join in censure of his seeming. Well, my lord, if he still ought, the whilst this play is playing, and scape detecting, I will pay the theft. They are coming to the play. I must be idle. Get you a place. Danish march, a flourish. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and others. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, i' faith, of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed. You cannot feed capons so. I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. To Polonius. My lord, you played once i' the university, you say. That did I, my lord, and was accounted a good actor. What did you enact? I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. Be the players ready. Ay, my lord, they stay upon your patience. Come hither, my dear Hamlet. Sit by me. No, good mother, here's metal more attractive. To King Claudius. Oh, ho! Do you mark that? Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, my head upon your lap. Ay, my lord. Do you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What is, my lord? Nothing. You are merry, my lord. Who? I. I, my lord. Oh, God, you're only jig-maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within these two hours. Nay, tis twice two months, my lord. So long? Nay, then, let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens! Die two months ago, and not forgotten yet? Then there's hope a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. But, by your lady, he must build churches, then. Or else shall he suffer not thinking on, with the hobby-horse, whose epitaph is, For O, oh, for O, oh, the hobby-horse is forgot. Hout boys play. The dumb show enters. Enter a king and a queen very lovingly. The queen embracing him, and he her. She kneels, and makes show of protestation unto him. He takes her up, and declines his head upon her neck lays him down upon a bank of flowers. She, seeing him asleep, leaves him. Anon comes in a fellow, takes off his crown, kisses it, and pours poison in the king's ears, and exit. The queen returns, finds the king dead, and makes passionate action. The poisoner, with some two or three mutes, comes in again, seeming to lament with her. The dead body is carried away. The poisoner woos the queen with gifts. She seems loath and unwilling a while, but in the end accepts his love. Exeunt. What means this, my lord? Mary, this is meeching malico. It means mischief. Belike this show imports the argument of the play. Enter prologue. We shall know by this fellow. The players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. Will he tell us what the show meant? Ay, or any show that you'll show him. Be not you ashamed to show, he'll not shame to tell you what it means. You are not, you are not. All mark the play. For us and for our tragedy, here stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. Exit. Is this a prologue or the posy of a ring? Tis brief, my lord. As woman's love. Enter two players, king and queen. 
Full thirty times hath Phoebus cart gone round Neptune's salt wash and Tellus orbid ground, and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen about the world have times twelve thirties been, since love our hearts and hymen did our hands unite commutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again count o'er ere love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer and from your former state, that I distrust you. Yet, though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, it nothing must. For women's fear and love holds quantity, in neither aught nor in extremity. Now what my love is, proof hath made you know, and as my love is sized, my fear is so. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are fear. Where little fears grow great, great love grows there. Faith, I must leave thee, love, and shortly, too, My operant powers their functions leave to do, And thou shalt live in this fair world behind, Honoured, beloved, and haply one as kind For husband shalt thou. Oh, confound the rest! Such love must needs be treason in my breast. In second husband let me be accursed. None wed the second but who killed the first. Wormwood, wormwood. The instances that second marriage move are base respects of thrift, but none of love. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think what now you speak. But what we do determine, oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory, Of violent birth, but poor validity, Which now, like fruit unripe, sticks on the tree, But fall unshaken, when they mellow be. Most necessary tis that we forget To pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. What to ourselves in passion we propose, The passion ending, doth the purpose lose the violence of either grief or joy their own enactures with themselves destroy where joy most revels grief doth most lament grief joys joy grieves on slender accident this world is not for i nor tis not strange that even our loves should with our fortunes change for tis a question left us yet to prove whether love lead fortune, or else fortune love. The great man down, you mark his favourite flies, the poor advanced, makes friends of enemies, and hitherto doth love on fortune tend, for who not needs shall never lack a friend, and who in want a hollow friend doth try, directly seasons him his enemy. But orderly to end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run, That our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours, their ends none of our own. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, But die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to me give food, nor heaven light. Sport and repose lock from me day and night. To desperation turn my trust and hope, An anchor's cheer in prison be my scope. Each opposite that blanks the face of joy, Meet what I would have well, and it destroy. Both here and hence pursue me lasting strife, If, once a widow, ever I be wife. If she should break it now, Tis deeply sworn, Sweet, leave me here a while, my spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile the tedious day with sleep. Sleep, rock thy brain, and never come mischance between us twain. Exit. Madam, how like you this play? The lady protests too much, methinks. Oh, but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in't? Oh, no, they do but jest, poison in jest, no offence of the world. What do you call the play? The Mouse Trap. 
Marry how? Tropically. This play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Gonzago is the duke's name, his wife, Baptista. You shall see anon, tis a knavish piece of work. But what of that? Your majesty and we that have free souls, it touches us not. Let the galled jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. Enter Lucianus. This is one Lucianus, nephew to the king. You are as good as a chorus, my lord. I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppets dallying. You are keen, my lord. You are keen. It would cost you a groaning to take off my edge. Still better, and worse. So you must take your husbands. Begin, murderer. Pox, leave thy damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Thoughts black, hands apt, drugs fit and time agreeing. Confederate season, else no creature seeing. Thou mixture rank of midnight weeds collected, With hecate band thrice blasted, thrice infected, Thy natural magic and dire property, On wholesome life usurp immediately. Pours the poison into the sleeper's ears. He poisons him i' the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and written choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The king rises. What, frighted with false fire? How fares, my lord? Give o'er the play. Give me some light. Away. Lights, lights, lights. Exeunt all but Hamlet and Horatio. Why, let the stricken deer go weep, the heart ungalled play. For some must watch while some must sleep, so runs the world away. Would not this, sir, and a forest of feathers, if the rest of my fortunes turn Turk with me, with two provincial roses on my raised shoes, get me a fellowship and a cry of players, sir? Half a share. A whole one, I. For thou dost know, O Damon dear, this realm dismantled was of Jove himself, and now reigns here a very, very pajock. You might have rhymed. Oh, good Horatio, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pound. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning. I did very well note him. Aha! Come, some music. Come, the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then, belike, he likes it not, Perdi. Come, some music. Re-enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Good, my lord. Vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. I, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvellous distempered with drink sir no my lord rather with choler your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to his doctor for for me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more choler good my lord put your discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair i am tame sir pronounce the queen your mother in most great affliction of spirit hath sent me to you you are welcome nay good my lord this courtesy is not of the right breed if it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer i will do your mother's commandment if not your pardon and my return shall be the end of my business sir i cannot what my lord make you a wholesome answer my wits diseased but sir such answer as i can make you shall command or rather as you say my mother therefore no more but to the matter my mother you say then thus she says your behaviour hath struck her into amazement and admiration oh wonderful son that can so astonish a mother but is there no sequel at the heels of this mother's admiration in part she desires to speak with you in our closet ere you go to bed we shall obey, were she ten times our mother. Have you any further trade with us? My lord, you once did love me. So I do still, by these pickers and stealers. Good my lord, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the door upon your own liberty, if you deny your griefs to your friend. Sir, I lack advancement. How can that be, when you have the voice of the king himself for your succession in Denmark? Ay, but, sir, while the grass grows, the proverb is something musty. Re-enter players with recorders. Oh, the recorders, let me see one. To withdraw with you, 
why do you go about to recover the wind of me as if you would drive me into a toil oh my lord if my duty be too bold my love is too unmannerly i do not well understand that will you play upon this pipe my lord i cannot i pray you believe me i cannot i do beseech you i know no touch of it my lord tis as easy as lying govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb give it breath with your mouth and it will discourse most eloquent music look you these are the stops but these i cannot command to any utterance of harmony i have not the skill why look you now how unworthy a thing you make of me you would play upon me you would seem to know my stops you would pluck out the heart of my mystery you would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass and there is much music excellent voice in this little organ yet cannot you make it speak splod do you think i am easier to be played on than a pipe call me what instrument you will though you can fret me yet you cannot play upon me enter polonius god bless you sir my lord the queen would speak with you and presently do you see yonder cloud that's almost in shape of a camel by the mass and tis like a camel indeed methinks it is like a weasel it is backed like a weasel or like a whale very like a whale then i will come to my mother by and by they fool me to the top of my bent i will come by and by i will say so by and by is easily said exit polonius leave me friends exeunt all but hamlet tis now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world now could i drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on soft now to my mother o oh, heart lose not thy nature let not ever the soul of nero enter this firm bosom let me be cruel not unnatural i will speak daggers to her but use none my tongue and soul in this be hypocrites how in my words soever she be shent to give them seals never my soul consent exit scene three a room in the castle enter king claudius rosencrantz and guildenstern i like him not nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range therefore prepare you i your commission will forthwith dispatch and he to england shall along with you the terms of our estate may not endure hazard so dangerous as doth hourly grow out of his lunacies we will ourselves provide most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty though single and peculiar life is bound with all the strength and armour of the mind to keep itself from noise but much more that spirit upon whose wheel depend and rest the lives of many the cease of majesty dies not alone but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it it is a massy wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and joined which when it falls each small annexment petty consequence attends the boisterous ruin never alone did the king sigh but with general groan arm you i pray you to this speedy voyage for we will fetters put upon this fear which now goes too free-footed we will, we will haste, haste us exeunt rosencrantz and guildenstern enter polonius my lord he's going to his mother's closet behind the arras i'll convey myself to hear the process and warrant she'll tax him home and as you said and wisely was it said tis meet that some more audience than a mother since nature makes them partial should o'erhear the speech of vantage fare you well my liege i'll call upon you ere you go to bed and tell you what i know thanks dear my lord exit polonius oh my offence is rank it smells to heaven it hath the primal eldest curse upon t a brother's murder pray can i not though inclination be as sharp as will 
my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin, and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Whereto serves mercy but to confront the visage of offence? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But, oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offence? In the corrupted currents of this world offence's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft tis seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling, there the action lies in his true nature. And we ourselves compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give in evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? O oh, wretched state! O oh, bosom black as death! O oh, limed soul that struggling to be free art more engaged! Help! Angels, make a say! Bow, stubborn knees, and heart with strings of steel be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Retires and kneels. Enter Hamlet. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. Well, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad-blown as flesh as may. And how his audit stands, who knows, save heaven. But in our circumstance and course of thought tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged, to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in't, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell whereto it goes. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. Exit. Rising. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Exit. Scene four. The Queen's Closet. Enter Queen Gertrude and Polonius. He will come straight. Look, you lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and that your grace hath screened and stood between much heat in him. I'll sconce me even here. Pray you, be round with him. Within. Mother, mother, mother! I'll warrant you, fear me not. Withdraw, I hear him coming. Polonius hides behind the arras. Enter Hamlet. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? 
No, by the rude not so, you are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and, would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then, I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come, and sit you down. You shall not budge, you go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help! Help! Ho! Behind. What ho? Help! 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 Drawing. How now? A rat? Dead for a ducat. Dead. Makes a pass through the arras. <sighs> oh, no. Falls and dies. Oh, me, what hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this? A bloody deed. Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Ay, lady, twas my word. Lifts up the arras and discovers Polonius. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool. Farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou find'st to be too busy is some danger. Leave wringing of your hands, peace, sit you down, and let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, if damned custom have not brassed it so that it is proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicers' oaths. Oh, such a deed, as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul, and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth glow, yea, this solidity and compound mass, with tristful visage, as against the doom, is thought sick at the act. Ah, me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look here, upon this picture and on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow, Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten and command, a station like the herald Mercury new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill, a combination and a form indeed, where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? Ha! Have you eyes? You cannot call it love, for at your age the heyday in the blood is tame, it's humble and waits upon the judgment. And what judgment would step from this to this? Sense, sure, you have, else could you not have motion. But sure that sense is apoplexed. For madness would not err, nor sense to ecstasy was ne'er so thralled, but it reserved some quantity of choice to serve in such a difference. What devil wast, that thus hath cousined you at hoodman blind? Eyes without feeling, feeling without sight, ears without hands or eyes, smelling sans all, or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope. O oh, shame, where is thy blush? Rebellious hell! If thou canst mutine in a matron's bones, to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire. Proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardour gives the charge, since frost itself as actively doth burn, and reason panders will. O oh, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tinct. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an enseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in mine ears. No more, sweet Hamlet. A murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part the tithe of your precedent lord, 
a vice of kings, a cut purse of the empire and the rule that from a shelf the precious diadem stole and put it in his pocket. No more. A king of shreds and patches. Enter ghost. Save me, and hover o'er me with your wings, you heavenly guards. What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do not you come your tardy son to chide? That lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command. Oh, say! Do not forget. This visitation is but to whet thy almost blunted purpose. But look! Amazement on thy mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you, that you do bend your eye on vacancy, and with the incorporal air do hold discourse? Forth at your eyes your spirits wildly peep. And as the sleeping soldiers in the alarm, your bedded hair, like life in excrements, starts up and stands on end. O oh, gentle sun, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. Whereon do you look? On him, on him. Look you how pale he glares. His form and cause conjoined, preaching to stones would make them capable. Do not look upon me, lest with this piteous action you convert my stern effects. Then what I have to do will want true color, tears perchance for blood. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all. Yet all that is I see. Nor did you nothing hear? No, nothing but ourselves. Why, look you there, look how it steals away! My father! In his habit as he lived, look where he goes even now out at the portal. Exit ghost. This the very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation ecstasy is very cunning in. Ecstasy? My pulse as yours doth temperately keep time, and makes as healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered. Bring me to the test, and I the matter will re-word which madness would gamble from. Mother, for love of grace, lay not that mattering unction to your soul that not your trespass but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. Confess yourself to heaven. Repent what's past. Avoid what is to come. And do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. Forgive me this my virtue, for in the fatness of these Percy times, Virtue itself of vice must pardon beg, yea, curb and woo for leave to do him good. O oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. O oh, throw away the worser part of it, and live the purer with the other half. Good night, but go not to mine uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. That monster, custom, who all sense doth eat of habit's devil, is angel yet in this that to the use of actions fair and good he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. Refrain to-night, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy, for use almost can change the stamp of nature, and either shame the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency. Once more, good-night, and when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. For this same Lord, pointing to Polonius, I do repent, but heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. I will bestow him, and will answer well the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel only to be kind. Thus bad begins and worse remains behind. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, and let him, for a pair of reachy kisses, or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers, make you to ravel all this matter out, that I, essentially, am not in madness, but mad in craft. 
twere good you let him know. For who that's but a queen, fair, sober, wise, would from a paddock, from a bat, a gib, such dear concernings hide? Who would do so? No. In despite of sense and secrecy, unpeg the basket on the house's top, let the birds fly, and, like the famous ape, to try conclusions, in the basket creep, and break your own neck down. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath, and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England. You know that. Alack, I had forgot. Tis so concluded on. There's letters sealed, and my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work, for tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Oh, tis most sweet when in one line two crafts directly meet. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. Mother, good night. Indeed, this counsellor is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish prating knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. Exeunt severally. Hamlet dragging in Polonius. End of Act Three. Act Four of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One A Room in the Castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. There's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate, tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Bestow this place on us a little while. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Ah, oh, my good lord, what have I seen to-night? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the sea and wind, when both contend which is the mightier. In his lawless fit, behind the arras, hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries, A rat, a rat, and in this brainish apprehension, kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed! It had been so with us had we been there. His liberty is full of threats to all, to you, yourself, to us, to every one. Oh, alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? It will be laid to us, whose providence should have kept short, restrained, and out of haunt this mad young man. But so much was our love we would not understand what was most fit. But like the owner of a foul disease, to keep it from divulging, let it feed even on the pith of life. Where is he gone? To draw apart the body he hath killed or whom his very madness, like some ore among a mineral of metal's base, shows itself pure. He weeps for what is done. Oh, Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship him hence. And this vile deed we must, with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. Ho, Guildenstern! Re-enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Friends both, go join you with some further aid. Hamlet in madness hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go seek him out. Speak fair, and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you, haste in this. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Come, Gertrude, we'll call up our wisest friends, and let them know both what we mean to do and what's untimely done. Oh, come away! My soul is full of discord and dismay. Exeunt. Scene two. Another room in the castle. Enter Hamlet. Safely stowed. Hamlet! Hamlet. Lord Hamlet! Lord Hamlet! What noise? Who calls on Hamlet? Oh, here they come. 
Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust whereto tis kin. Tell us where tis, that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord? I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them, like an ape, in the corner of his jaw, first mouthed to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but squeezing you, and sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I am glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, you must tell us where the body is, and go with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord. Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hide fox and all after. Exeunt. Scene three. Another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, attended. I have sent to seek him and to find the body. How dangerous is it that this man goes loose! Yet must not we put the strong law on him? He's loved of the distracted multitude, who like not in their judgment but their eyes. And where tis so, the offender's scourge is weighed, but never the offence. To bear all smooth and even, this sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved, or not at all. Enter Rosencrantz. How now? What hath befallen? Where the dead body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without, my lord. Guarded, to know your pleasure. Bring him before us. Ho, oh, Guildenstern, bring in my lord. Enter Hamlet and Guildenstern. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper. Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are e'en at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Two dishes but to one table. That's the end. <sighs> alas, alas! A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and cat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost you mean by this? Nothing, but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send hither to see. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. But, indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go seek him there. He will stay till you come. Exeunt attendants. Hamlet, this deed, for thine especial safety, which we do tender as we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself. The bark is ready, and the wind at help. The associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England? Ay, Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewest our purposes. I see a cherub that sees them. But come for England. Farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh and so. My mother. Come, for England. Exit. Follow him at foot. Tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not. I'll have him hence to-night. Away! for everything is sealed and done that else leans on the affair. Pray you make haste. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And, England, if my love thou holdst at aught, as my great power thereof may give thee sense, since yet thy cicatrice looks raw and red after the Danish sword, and thy free awe pays homage to us, thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign process which imports at full by letters congruing to that effect the present death of hamlet do it england 
for like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me. Till I know tis done, howe'er my haps my joys were ne'er begun. Exit. Scene four. A plain in Denmark. Enter Fortinbras, a captain, and soldiers marching. Go, Captain, from me greet the Danish king. Tell him that, by his license, Fortinbras craves the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom. You know the rendezvous. If that his majesty would order with us, we shall express our duty in his eye. And let him know so. I will do it, my lord. Go softly on. Exeunt Fortinbras and soldiers. Enter Hamlet. Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and others. Good sir, whose powers are these? They are of Norway, sir. How purposed, sir, I pray you? Against some part of Poland. Who commands them, sir? The nephews to old Norway, Fortinbras. Goes it against the main of Poland, sir, or for some frontier? Truly to speak, and with no addition, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name to pay five ducats five i would not farm it nor will it yield to norway or the pole a rancor raid should it be sold in fee why then the polack never will defend it yes it is already garrisoned two thousand souls and twenty thousand ducats will not debate the question of this straw this is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies I humbly thank you, sir. God be with you, sir. Exit. Wilt please you go, my lord? I'll be with you straight. Go a little before. Exeunt all except Hamlet. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast, no more. Sure, he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now whether it be bestial oblivion, or some craven scruple, of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which, quartered, hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward, I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do, sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples gross as earth exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge, led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit, with divine ambition puffed, makes mouths at the invisible event exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune death and danger dare even for an egg-shell rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honour is at the stake how stand i then that have a father killed a mother stained excitements of my reason and my blood and let all sleep while to my shame I see the imminent death of twenty thousand men that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Exit. Scene five. Elsinore. A room in the castle. Enter Queen Gertrude, Horatio, and a gentleman. I will not speak with her. She is importunate, indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks i' the world, and hems and beats her heart, spurns enviously at straws speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense her speech is nothing yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection they aim at it and botch the words up fit to their own thoughts 
which as her winks and nods and gestures yield them indeed would make one think there might be sought though nothing sure yet much unhappily twere good she were spoken with for she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds let her come in exit horatio to my sick soul as sin's true nature is each toy seems prologue to some great amiss so full of artless jealousy is guilt it spills itself in fearing to be spilt re-enter horatio with ophelia where is the beauteous majesty of denmark how now ophelia how should i your true love know from another one by his cockle hat and staff and his sandal shoon alas sweet lady what imports this song say you nay pray you mark he is dead and gone lady he is dead and gone at his hat a grass green turf at his heels a stone nay but ophelia pray you mark white his shroud as the mountain snow enter king claudius alas look here my lord lauded with sweet flowers which bewept to the grave did go with true love showered how do you pretty lady well god illed you they say the owl was a baker's daughter lord we know what we are but know not what we may be god be at your table conceit upon her father pray you let's have no words of this but when they ask you what it means say you this to-morrow is saint valentine's day all in the morning be time and i a maid at your window to be your valentine then up he rose and donned his clothes and upped the chamber door let in the maid that out a maid never departed more pretty ophelia indeed law without an oath i'll make an end on it by guess and by sane charity alack and fie for shame young men will do it if they come to it by cock they are to blame quoth she before you tumbled me you promised me to wed so would i a done by yonder sun and thou hadst not come to my bed how long hath she been thus i hope all will be well we must be patient but i cannot choose but weep to think they should lay him in the cold ground my brother shall know of it and so i thank you for your good counsel come my coach good night ladies good night sweet ladies good night good night exit follow her close give her good watch i pray you exit horatio oh this is the poison of deep grief it springs all from her father's death oh gertrude gertrude when sorrows come they come not single spies but in battalions first her father slain next your son gone and he most violent author of his own just remove the people muddied thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good polonius's death and we have done but greenly in hugger-mugger to inter him poor ophelia divided from herself and her fair judgment without the which we are pictures or mere beasts last and as much containing as all these her brother is in secret come from france 
feeds on his wonder, keeps himself in clouds, and wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death. Wherein necessity of matter beggared will nothing stick our person to a rein in ear and ear. Oh, my dear Gertrude, this, like to a murdering piece, in many places gives me superfluous death. A noise within. Alack, what noise is this? Where are my Switzers? Let them guard the door. Enter another gentleman. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean, overpairing of his list, eats not the flats with more impetuous haste than young Laertes in a riotous head, or bears your officers. The rabble call him lord, and as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word, they cry, Choose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, hands, and tongues applaud it to the clouds. Laertes shall be king, Laertes king. How cheerfully on the false trail they cry. Oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs. The doors are broke. Noise within. Enter Laertes, armed, Danes following. Where is this king? Sirs, stand you all without. No, no let's, come, let's in. come in. I pray you, give me leave. We, we will. will. We will. We will. They retire without the door. I thank you. Keep the door. O thou vile king, give me my father. Calmly, good Laertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. Cries cuckold to my father, brands a harlot even here between the chaste unsmirched brow of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude, do not fear our person. Though such divinity doth hedge a king, that treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. To this point I stand, that both the worlds I give to negligence, let come what comes, only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will, not all the world. And for my means, I'll husband them so well, they shall go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is't writ in your revenge, that swoopstake you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? None but his enemies. Will you know them, then? To his good friends, thus wild, I'll ope my arms, and like the kind life-rendering pelican, repass them with my blood. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman. That I am guiltless of your father's death, and am most sensible in grief for it, it shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Let, Let her come, come, in. come in. Oh, now, what noise is that? Re-enter Ophelia. O oh, heat, dry up my brains, tears seven times salt, burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven thy madness shall be paid by weight, till our scale turn the beam, O rose of May. Dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia, O heavens, is possible a young maid's wits should be as moral as an old man's life? Nature is fine in love, and where tis fine, it sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves. They bore him barefaced on the bier, hey nan nanny nanny hey nanny, and in his grave rained many a tear. Fare you well, my dove. Hadst thou thy wits and didst persuade revenge, it could not move thus. You must sing a down a down, and you call him a down a oh, how the wheel becomes it. It is the false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than matter. There's Rosemary. 
That's for remembrance. Pray, love, remember. And then there's pansies. That's for thoughts. A document in madness, thoughts and remembrance fitted. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's rue for you and here's some for me. We may call it herb grace of Sundays. Oh, you must weigh your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. For bonny, sweet Robin, is all my joy. Thought and affliction, passion, hell itself, she turns to favor and to prettiness. And will he not come again? And will he not come again? No, no, he is dead. Go to thy deathbed. He never will come again. His beard was as white as snow. All flax sin was his ball. He is gone, he is gone, and we cast away moan. God have mercy on his soul, and of all Christian souls I pray God God be with ye. Exit. Do you see this, O oh God? Laertes, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. Go but apart, make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we can ours, to you in satisfaction. But if not, be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labour with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. His means of death, his obscure funeral, no trophy sworn, nor hatchment o'er his bones, no noble right, nor formal ostentation, cry to be heard as twere from heaven to earth that i must call it in question so you shall and where the offence is let the great axe fall i pray you go with me exeunt scene six another room in the castle enter horatio and a servant what are they that would speak with me sailors sir they say they have letters for you let them come in Exit, servant. I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted, if not from Lord Hamlet. Enter, sailors. God bless you, sir. Let him bless thee, too. He shall, sir, and please him. There's a letter for you, sir. It comes from the ambassador that was bound for England. If your name be Horatio, as I am let to know it is. Reads. Horatio. When thou shalt have overlooked this, Give these fellows some means to the king. They have letters for him. Ere we were two days old at sea, a pirate of very warlike appointment gave us chase. Finding ourselves too slow of sail, we put on a compelled valor, and in the grapple I boarded them, on the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much speed as thou wouldst fly death. I have words to speak in thine ear will make thee dumb, yet are they much too light for the bore of the matter. These good fellows will bring thee where I am. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell. He that knowest thine, Hamlet. Come, I will make you way for these your letters and do it the speedier, that you may direct me to him from whom you brought them. Exeunt. Scene 7. Another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius and Laertes. Now must your conscience my acquaintance seal, and you must put me in your heart for friend, 
Sith you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain pursued my life. It well appears, but tell me why you proceeded not against these feats, so crimeful and so capital in nature, as by your safety, wisdom, all things else, you mainly were stirred up. Oh, for two special reasons, which may to you perhaps seem much unsinewed, but yet to me they are strong. The queen his mother lives almost by his looks. And for myself, my virtue or my plague, be it either which, she's so conjunctive to my life and soul, that as the star moves not but in his sphere, I could not but by her. The other motive, why to a public count I might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him who, dipping all his faults in their affection, would, like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convert his jives to graces, so that my arrows, too slightly timbered for so loud a wind, would have reverted to my bow again, and not where I had aimed them. And so have I a noble father lost, a sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back again, should challenge her on mount of all the age for her perfections. But my revenge will come! Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it pastime. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father, and we love ourself, and that, I hope, will teach you to imagine— Enter a messenger. How now? What news? Letters, my lord, from Hamlet. This to your majesty, this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say. I saw them not. They were given me by Claudio. He received them of him that brought them. Laertes, you shall hear them. Leave us. Exit messenger. Reads. High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. To-morrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes. When I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return. Hamlet. What should this mean? Are all the rest come back? Or is it some abuse and no such thing? Know you the hand? Tis Hamlet's character. Naked? And in a postscript here he says alone. Can you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord. But let him come. It warms a very sickness in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth, Thus didst thou. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so, how otherwise? Will you be ruled by me? Ay, my lord. So you will not or rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit, now ripe in my device, under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death no wind of blame shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice, and call it accident. My lord, I will be ruled, the rather if you could devise it so, that I might be the organ. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travel much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. Your sum of parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one, and that in my regard of the unworthiest siege. What part is that, my lord? A very ribband in the cap of youth, yet needful too, for youth no less becomes the light and careless livery that it wears than settled age his sables and his weeds importing health and graveness. Two months since— here was a gentleman of Normandy. I've seen myself, and served against the French, and they can well on horseback. But this gallant had witchcraft in't. He grew under his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse as he had been encorpsed and demi-natured with the brave beast. So far he topped my thought, that I, in forgery of shapes and tricks, come short of what he did. A Norman was A Norman. Upon my life, Le Monde. The very same. I know him well. He is the brute indeed, and gem of all the nation. He made confession of you, 
and gave you such a masterly report for art and exercise in your defence, and for your rapier most especially, that he cried out, "'Twould be a sight indeed if one could match you. The scrimers of their nation, he swore, had had neither motion, guard, nor eye, if you opposed them. So this report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy, that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming o'er to play with him. Now, out of this— What out of this, my lord? Laertes, was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time, and that I see, in passages of proof, time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it, and nothing is at a like goodness still. For goodness, growing to a pleurisy, dies in his own too much. That we would do, we should do when we would. For this would changes, and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, our hands, our accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easing. But to the quick of the ulcer, Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? To cut his throat of the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuarize. Revenge should have no bounds. But, good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet return shall know you are come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence, and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you. Bring in fine together, and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils. So that, with ease, or a little shuffling, you may choose a sword unbated, and in a pass of practice requite him for your father. I will do it, and for that purpose I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank, so mortal that but dip a knife in it, where it draws blood no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death that is but scratched withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion that, if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Let's further think of this. Weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit us to our shape. If this should fail, and that our drift look through our bad performance, twere better not assayed. Therefore this project should have a back or second that might hold if this should blast in proof. Soft, let me see. We'll make a solemn wager on your cunnings. I hat. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end, and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nonce, whereon but sipping, if he by chance escape your venomed stock, our purpose may hold there. Enter Queen Gertrude. How now, sweet queen? One woe doth tread upon another's heel. So fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. Drowned? Oh, where? There is a willow grows aslant a brook, that shows his whole leaves in the glassy stream. There, with fantastic garlands, did she come, of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There, on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds, clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like, a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes, as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature, native, and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Alas, then she is drowned? Drowned, drowned. 
too much of water hast thou poor ophelia and therefore i forbid my tears but yet it is our trick nature her custom holds let shame say what it will when these are gone the woman will be out adieu my lord i have a speech of fire that fain would blaze but that this folly doubts it exit oh, let's follow gertrude how much i had to do to calm his rage now fear i this will give it start again therefore let's follow exeunt end of act four Act Five of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One A Churchyard. Enter two clowns with spades, etc. Is she to be buried in Christian burial that wilfully seeks her own salvation? I'll tell thee she is, and therefore make her grave straight. The crown her hath sat on her, and finds it Christian burial. How can that be, unless she drowned herself in her own defence? Why, tis found so. It must be, say, offendendo. It cannot be else. For here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act, and an act hath three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Our gal, she drowned herself wittingly. Nay, but ere you, Goodman Delver. Give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is willy nil he, he goes mark you that but if the water come to him and drown him he drowns not himself our gal he that is not guilty of his own death shortens not his own life but is this law ay marry is crowner's quest law will you have the truth on t if this had not been a gentlewoman she should have been buried out a christian burial why there thou sayst and the more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than their even christian come my spade there's no ancient gentleman but gardeners ditchers and grave-makers they hold up adam's profession was he a gentleman he was the first that ever bore arms why he had none what art a heathen how dost thou understand the scripture the scripture says adam digged could he dig without arms i'll put another question to thee if thou answerest me not to the purpose confess thyself go to what is he that builds stronger than either the mason the shipwright or the carpenter the gallows maker for that frame outlives a thousand tenants i like thy wit well in good faith the gallows does well but how does it well? It does well to those that do in. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Our gal, the gallows may do well to thee. To it again, come. Who builds stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Aye, tell me that, and unyoke. Marry, now I can tell. To it. Mass, I cannot tell. Enter Hamlet and Horatio at a distance ah, cudgel thy brains no more about it for your dull ass will not mend its pace with beating and when you are asked this question next say a grave maker the houses that he makes last till doomsday go get thee to yawn fetch me a stoop of liquor exit second clown he digs and sings in youth when i did love did love me thought it was very sweet to contract all the time for ah my behove oh me thought there was nothing meet 
Has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave-making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. Tis e'en so. The hand of little employment hath the daintier sense. But age with his stealing steps hath clawed me in his clutch, and hath shipped me into the land as if I had never been such. Throws up a skull. That skull had a tongue in it, and could sing once. How the knave jowls it to the ground as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. It might be the pate of a politician which this ass now o'erreaches, one that would circumvent God, might it not? It might, my lord. Or of a courtier which could say, Good morning, sweet lord, how dost thou, good lord? This might be my lord such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse when he meant to beg it, might it not? Ay, my lord. Why, e'en so. And now my lady worms, chapless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton's spade. Here's fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. Did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggets with them? Mine ache to think on't. A pickaxe and a spade, a spade, for and a shrouding sheet. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made, for such a guest is meet. Throws up another skull. There's another. Why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quiddities now, his quillets, his cases, his tenures, and his tricks? Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel, and will not tell him of his action of battery? Hum, this fellow might be in time a great buyer of land, with his statutes, his recognizances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines, and the recovery of his recoveries, to have his fine pate full of fine dirt? Will his vouchers vouch him no more of his purchases, and double ones, too, than the length and breadth of a pair of indentures? The very conveyances of his lands will hardly lie in this box. And must the inheritor himself have no more, huh? Not a jot more, my lord. Is not parchment made of sheepskins? Aye, my lord, and of calfskins, too. They are sheep and calves which seek out assurance in that. I will speak to this fellow. Whose grave's this, sirrah? Mine, sir. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made, for such a guest is meet. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in't. You lie out on, sir, and therefore tis not yours. For my part I do not lie in it, yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in't to be in't and say it is thine. "'Tis for the dead, not for the quick, therefore thou liest. "'Tis a quick lie, sir, till away again, from me to you. "'What man dost thou dig it for?' "'For no man, sir.' "'What woman, then?' "'For none, neither.' "'Who is to be buried in't?' "'One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead.' "'How absolute the knave is! "'We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us.' By the Lord, Horatio, these three years I have taken a note of it. The age is grown so picked that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier he gaffs his kibe. How long hast thou been a grave-maker? Of all the days in the year, I came to it that day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He that is mad and sent into England. Ay, Mary, why was he sent into England? Why, because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or, if he do not, tis no great matter there. Why? To not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he. How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith, him with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. I have been sexton here, man and boy, thirty years. How long will a man lie i' the earth ere he rot? Hey, faith, if he be not rotten before he die, 
as we have many poxy courses nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in he will last you some eight year or nine year a tanner will last you nine year why he more than another why sir his hide is so tanned with his trade that he will keep out water a great while and your water is a sore decayer of your horse and dead body here's a skull now this skull has lain in the earth three and twenty years whose was it a horse and mad fellow it was whose do you think it was nay i know not a pestilence on him for a mad rogue i poured a flag and a rhenish on my head once this same skull sir was sir yorick's skull the king's jester this e'en that let me see takes the skull alas poor yorick i knew him horatio a fellow of infinite jest of most excellent fancy he hath borne me on his back a thousand times and now how abhorred in my imagination it is oh, my gorge rises at it here hung those lips that i have kissed i know not how oft where be your gibes now your gambols your songs your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar not one now to mock your own grinning quite chapfallen now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her let her paint an inch thick to this favour she must come make her laugh at that prithee horatio tell me one thing what's that my lord dost thou think alexander looked to this fashion of the earth e'en so and smelt so p puts down the skull e'en so my lord to what base uses we may return horatio why may not imagination trace the noble dust of alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole twere to consider too curiously to consider so no faith not a jot but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it as thus alexander died alexander was buried alexander returneth into dust the dust is earth of earth we make loam and why of that loam whereto he was converted might they not stop a beer barrel imperious caesar dead and turned to clay might stop a hole to keep the wind away oh that that earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter flaw but soft but soft aside here comes the king enter priest etc in procession the corpse of ophelia laertes and mourners following king claudius queen gertrude their trains etc the queen the courtiers who is this they follow and with such maimed rites this doth betoken the course they follow did with desperate hand fordo its own life twas of some estate couch we a while and mark retiring with horatio what ceremony else that is laertes a very noble youth mark what ceremony else her obsequies have been as far enlarged as we have warrantise her death was doubtful and but that great command or sways the order she should in ground unsanctified have lodged till the last trumpet for charitable prayers shards flints and pebbles should be thrown on her yet here she is allowed her virgin crants her maiden struments and the bringing home of bell and burial must there no more be done no more be done we should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls lay her in the earth and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring i tell thee trellis priest a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling what the fair ophelia sweets to the sweet farewell scattering flowers i hoped thou shouldst have been my hamlet's wife i thought thy bride-bed to have decked sweet maid and not have strewed thy grave oh treble woe fall ten times treble on that cursed head 
whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of hold off the earth awhile till i have caught her once more in mine arms leaps into the grave now pile your dust upon the quick and dead till up this flat a mountain you have made to o'ertop old pelion or the skyish head of blue olympus what is he whose grief bears such an emphasis whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers this is i hamlet the dane leaps into the grave the devil take thy soul grappling with him thou prayest not well i prithee take thy fingers from my throat for though i am not splenitive and rash yet have i something in me dangerous which let thy wiseness fear hold off thy hand pluck them asunder hamlet hamlet gentlemen good my lord be quiet the attendants part them and they come out of the grave why i will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag oh my son what theme i loved ophelia forty thousand brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum what wilt thou do for her oh he is mad laertes for love of god forbear him swoon show me what thou do would weep would fight would fast would tear thyself would drink up eyes i'll eat a crocodile i'll do it dost thou come here to whine to outface me with leaping in her grave be buried quick with her and so will i and if thou prate of mountains let them throw millions of acres on us till our ground singeing his pate against the burning zone make ossa like a wart nay an thou mouth i'll rant as well as thou this is mere madness and thus a while the fit will work on him anon as patient as the female dove when that her golden couplets are disclosed his silence will sit drooping hear you sir what is the reason that you use me thus i loved you ever but it is no matter let hercules himself do what he may the cat will mew and dog will have his day exit I pray you, good Horatio, wait upon him. Exit Horatio to Laertes. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet shortly shall we see. Till then in patience our proceeding be. Exeunt. Scene two. A hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and Horatio. So much for this, sir. Now shall you see the other. You do remember all the circumstance. Remember it, my lord? Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutines and the bilbos. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well, when our deep plots do pall. And that should teach us there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. That is most certain. Up from my cabin, my sea gowns scarfed about me, in the dark groped I to find out them, had my desire, fingered their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold, my fears forgetting manners, to unseal their grand commission, where I found Horatio, oh, royal knavery, an exact command larded with many several sorts of reasons importing denmark's health and england's too with ho oh, such bugs and goblins in my life that on the supervise no leisure baited no not to stay the grinding of the axe my head should be struck off is it possible here's the commission read it at more leisure but wilt thou hear me how i did proceed i beseech you being thus benetted round with villains, ere I could make a prologue to my brains they had begun the play, I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. I once did hold it, as our statists do, a baseness to write fair, and laboured much how to forget that learning. But, sir, now it did me yeoman's service. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? Aye, good, my lord. An earnest conjuration from the king, 
As England was his faithful tributary, as love between them like the palm might flourish, as peace should stiff her wheaten garland wear and stand a comma between their amities, and many such like asses of great charge, that on the view and knowing of these contents, without debatement further, more or less, he should the bearers put to sudden death, not shriving time allowed. How was this sealed? Why, even in that was heaven ordinant. I had my father's signet in my purse, which was the model of that Danish seal, folded the writ up in form of the other, subscribed it, gave it the impression, placed it safely, the changeling never known. Now the next day was our sea-fight, and what to this was sequent thou knowest already. So Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. Their defeat does by their own insinuation grow. Tis dangerous when the baser nature comes between the pass and fell incensed points of mighty opposites. Why, what a king is this! Does it not, thinkst thee, stand me now upon? He that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage, is not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm? And is't not to be damned, to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? It must be shortly known to him from England what is the issue of the business there. It will be short. The interim is mine, and a man's life's no more than to say one. But I am very sorry, good Horatio, that to Laertes I forgot myself, for by the image of my cause I see the portraiture of his. I'll court his favours. But sure the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. Peace! Who comes here? Enter Osric. Ah, your lordship is right welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Dost know this waterfly? No, my good lord. Thy state is the more gracious, for tis a vice to know him. He hath much land and fertile. Let a beast be lord of beasts, and his crib shall stand at the king's mess. Tis a chuff. But, as I say, spacious in the possession of dirt. Sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Put your bonnet to his right use. Tis for the head. I thank your lordship. It is very hot. No, believe me, tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. But yet methinks it is very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord, it is very sultry, as twere. I cannot tell how. But, my lord, his majesty bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. <sighs> Sir, this is the matter. I beseech you, remember. Hamlet moves him to put on his hat. Nay, good my lord, for my knees in good faith. Sir, here is newly come to court Laertes. Believe me, an absolute gentleman, full of most excellent differences, of very soft society and great showing. Indeed, to speak feelingly of him, he is the card or calendar of gentry, for you shall find in him the continent of what part a gentleman would see. Sir, his definement suffers no perdition in you, though I know to divide him inventorially would dizzy the arithmetic of memory, and yet but yaw neither in respect of his quick sale. But in the verity of extolment I take him to be a soul of great article, and his infusion of such dearth and rareness as to make true diction of him, his semblable is his mirror, and who else would trace him? His umbrage, nothing more. Ah, your lordship speaks most infallibly of him. The concernancy, sir, why do we wrap the gentleman in our more rawer breath? Ah, sir. Is it not possible to understand in another tongue? You will do it, sir, really. What imports the nomination of this gentleman? Of Laertes. 
His purse is empty already. All his golden words are spent. Of him, sir. I know you are not ignorant. I would you did, sir, yet, in faith, if you did, it would not much approve me. Well, sir? You are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I dare not confess that, lest I should compare with him in excellence. But to know a man well were to know himself. I mean, sir, for his weapon. But in the imputation laid on him by them, in his meed he's unfellowed. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath wagered with him six Barbary horses, against the which he has imponed, as I take it, six French rapiers and poniards, with their assigns, as girdle, hangers, and so, three of the carriages in face are very dear to fancy, very responsive to the hilts most delicate carriages and of very liberal conceit what call you the carriages i knew you must be edified by the margent ere you had done ah the carriages sir are the hangers the phrase would be more german to the matter if we could carry cannon by our sides i would it might be hangers till then but on six barbary horses against six french swords their assigns and three liberal conceited carriages that's the french bet against the danish why is this imponed as you call it the king sir has laid that in a dozen passes between yourself and him he shall not exceed you three hits he hath laid on twelve for nine and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer how if i answer no i mean my lord the opposition of your person in trial sir i will walk here in the hall if it please his majesty tis the breathing time of day with me let the foils be brought the gentleman willing and the king hold his purpose i will win for him an i can if not, I will gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. Shall I re-deliver you in so? To this effect, sir, after what flourish your nature will. Ah, I commend my duty to your lordship. <sighs> yours, yours. Exit Osric. He does well to commend it himself. There are no tongues else for his turn. This lapwing runs away with the shell on his head he did comply with his dug before he sucked it thus has he and many more of the same bevy that i know the dressy age dotes on only got the tune of the time and outward habit of encounter a kind of yesty collection which carries them through and through the most fond and winnowed opinions and do but blow them to their trial the bubbles are out enter a lord my lord his majesty commended him to you by young osric who brings back to him that you attend him in the hall. He sends to know if your pleasure hold to play with Laertes, or that you will take longer time. I am constant to my purpose. They follow the king's pleasure. If his fitness speaks, mine is ready, now or whensoever, provided I be so able as now. The king and queen and all are coming down. In happy time. The queen desires you to use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before you fall to play she well instructs me exit lord you will lose this wager my lord i do not think so since he went into france i have been in continual practice i shall win at the odds but thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart but it is no matter nay good my lord it is but foolery but it is such a kind of gain giving as would perhaps trouble a woman if your mind dislike anything obey it i will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit not a whit we defy augury there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow if it be now tis not to come if it be not to come it will be now if it be not now yet it will come the readiness is all since no man has aught of what he leaves what is to leave betimes? 
Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Laertes, Lords, Osric, and attendants with foils, etc. Come, Hamlet, come, and take this hand from me. King Claudius puts Laertes' hand into Hamlet's. Give me your pardon, sir. I've done you wrong. But pardon, as you are a gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have heard, how I am punished with sore distraction. What I have done, that might your nature, honour, and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim was madness. Wast Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be ta'en away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not, Hamlet denies it. Who does it, then? His madness. If to be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wronged. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts, that I have shot mine arrow o'er the house, and hurt my brother. I am satisfied in nature, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge, but in my terms of honour I stand aloof, and will no reconcilement, till by some elder masters of known honour. I have a voice and precedent of peace to keep my name on gourd, but till that time I do receive your offered love like love, and will not wrong it. I embrace it freely, and will this brother's wager frankly play. Give us the foils, come on. Come, one for me. I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance your skill shall, like a star i' the darkest night, stick fiery off indeed. You mock me, sir. No, by this hand. Give them the foils, young Osric. Cousin Hamlet, you know the wager. Very well, my lord. Your grace hath laid the odds of the weaker side. I do not fear it. I have seen you both. But since he is bettered, we have therefore odds. This is too heavy. Let me see another. This likes me well. These foils have all a length. Ay, my good lord. Set me the stoops of wine upon that table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath, and in the cup and union shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Give me the cups, and let the kettle to the trumpet speak, the trumpets to the cannoneer without, the cannons to the heavens, the heavens to earth. Now the king drinks to Hamlet. Come, begin, and you the judges bear a wary eye. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. They play. One. No. Judgment. A hit, a very palpable hit. Well, again. Stay. Give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Trumpets sound, and cannon shot off within. Give him the cup. I'll play this bout first. Set it by a while. Come. They play. Another hit, what say you? A touch, a touch, I do confess. Our son shall win. He's fat and scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Good madam. Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. I dare not drink yet, madam. By and by. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. I do not think t. And yet tis almost against my conscience. Come, for the third layer tease you but dally. I pray you, pass with your best violence. I am afeard you make a wanton of me. Say you so? Come on. They play. Nothing neither way. Have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet. Then in scuffling they change rapiers, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. Part them, they are incensed. Nay, come again. Queen Gertrude falls. Oh, look to the queen there. Who? Oh. They bleed on both sides. How is it, my lord? How is it, Laertes? Why, as a woodcock to mine own springe, Osric, I am justly killed with mine own treachery. How does the queen? She swoons to see them bleed. No, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. 
dies. Oh, villainy! Ho, oh, let the door be locked! Treachery! Seek it out! It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. The point, envenomed too. Then venom to thy work. Stabs King Claudius. Treason, treason. Oh, yet defend me, friends. I am but hurt. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. King Claudius dies. He is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Dies. Heaven make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, a Jew. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, that are but mutes or audience to this act, had I but time, as this fell sergeant, death is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you. But let it be. Horatio, I am dead, thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Never believe it. I am more a Roman than a Dane. Here's yet some liquor left. As thou art a man, give me the cup. Let go. By heaven I'll have it. Oh, good Horatio, what a wounded name things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. March afar off, and shot within. What warlike noise is this? Young Fortinbras, with conquest come from Poland, to the ambassadors of England, gives this warlike volley. Oh, I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite o'ercrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England. But I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him, with the occurrence, more or less, which have solicited. The rest is silence. Dies. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Why does the drum come hither? March within, enter Fortinbras, the English ambassadors, and others. Where is this sight? What is it you would see, if aught of woe or wonder? Cease your search. This quarry cries on havoc, O oh, proud death! What feast is toward in thine eternal cell, that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? The sight is dismal, and our affairs from England come too late. The ears are senseless that should give us hearing. To tell him his commandment is fulfilled, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where should we have our thanks? Not from his mouth had it the ability of life to thank you. He never gave commandment for their death. But since, so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polack Wars, and you from England, are here arrived, give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view, and let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot, purposes mistook fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. Let us haste to hear it, and call the noblest to the audience. For me, with sorrow I embrace my fortune, 
I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now, to claim my vantage, doth invite me. Of that I shall have also cause to speak, and from his mouth whose voice will draw on more. But let this same be presently performed, even while men's minds are wild, lest more mischance on plots and errors happen. Let four captains bear Hamlet, like a soldier, to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royally, and for his passage the soldier's music and the rites of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. A dead march. Exeunt, bearing off the dead bodies, after which a peal of ordnance is shot off. End of Act 5 End of Hamlet by William Shakespeare